So yeah, so as mentioned, I'm an MD-PhD student at Johns Hopkins University, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we've been using this union biometric or technology of large particle facts to enable uh, some of our studies with cardiac and skeletal muscle. I'll be focusing a bit more on the cardiac end, but I wanted to give you guys a taster of some of the other work we're doing as well. Uh, before I get started, I just want to let you guys know I have no disclosures. I'm not formally affiliated with Union Biometrica. I just want to give you guys a sense of how we've used this technology in our work. So for a bit of background and context, our lab is focused on cardiac developmental biology and disease. And as a result, one of the cell types that we're really interested in is the cardiomyocyte, which is the primary contractile cell of the heart. Now, because of its central role in the heart's key functions, there's been a lot of interest in trying to study the molecular underpinnings of cardiomyocytes, uh, both in developmental and disease processes. And one way to go about doing this, as you know, I think many of you all may know, is through single cell RNA sequencing, which enables us to study the transcriptome of cardiomyocytes at the single cell level. However, while there's been a, you know, if you, you know, dive into the literature, just about every study these days is a new single cell study of another tissue, but there have been relatively few of adult cardiomyocytes. And this has to do with one of the major technical limitations in the field. So cardiomyocytes can have a unique biology. They have this rod shape uh, and in the long axis have an average size of uh, 125 microns in, uh, in length. And this is much, much larger than most of the cells that are being used for single cell RNA sequencing, which are on the order of maybe you know, 10 to 20 microns in, in maximum size. And so there, the, a fundamental limitation in the field is the need for a method to isolate high quality single cardiomyocytes. And I wanna illustrate exactly what this problem looks like. So in the field, a standard way to kind of dissociate a heart is through this method called Langendorf dissociation, where you perfuse the coronary vasculature with your enzymatic dissociation mix, and that digests the heart to give you this mixture of cardiac cells. And this mixture will be composed of healthy rods, as you can see here. These are the cardiomyocytes that we want to isolate, as well as both non-cardiomyocytes and these dead cells, which you know, look rounded up. And so again, the goal is to separate these rods from the dead cells at single cell level. So our lab does a lot of uh, facts and we have a Sony sorter set up in our lab that we use for a lot of our early embryonic work. So we, you know, we tried our adult cardiomyocyte uh, dissociation mix through our fax sorter uh, and set kind of standard gates, both for size and then using DAPI, we tried to pick out what should ostensibly be are live healthy myocytes. We use for this our chip, which is a 130 micron chip. And when we sorted this population, unfortunately what we found was most of what we got back didn't look like healthy rods. In fact, the overwhelming majority of the cells were pretty clearly dead, but even those that weren't had either sheared or distorted structure. And so obviously this throws out a lot of the applications that we could possibly do with these cells. And as I'll demonstrate later in particular, it throws out our ability to do single cell RNA sequencing and get good high quality data. So Union Biometrica has developed this technology to enable large particle facts and researchers have used this for a number of applications. For example, um, applications with Drosophila embryos or C. elegans or very large cell clusters. Our question was, could we try and use this technology to help us isolate healthy myocytes so that we could do our RNA sequencing experiments? So apologies in advance if you guys have kind of seen this technology before, I just wanted to give you a sense of what our setup looked like. So we were using this COPUS FP select instrument, which I think at this point is a little bit outdated in fact, it's been upgraded to what's now the FP500 and the newer versions come with more trills and frills than the, the one that we had worked with. Um, but the sorter that we used in particular has a 500 micron flow cell with kind of a sorting range of about up to 400 microns uh, in size. So obviously much larger than many conventional sorters. Uh, this instrument allows for quantification of time and flight, uh, which is kind of a size correlate and light extinction, which is kind of an optical density correlate. 
If you're familiar with facts, these are sort of similar to the forward and side scatter that you might see there. Our sorter came equipped with a 488 laser with several filters for kind of commonly used fluorescent tags. And as you can see here in this collection stage area, uh, this can sort directly into multi-well plates. Our instrument goes up to 96 wells, but I think some of the newer versions actually have increased capacity up to 384 wells, which is really helpful, of course, for high throughput sequencing. And as a whole, in addition to being kind of useful for large objects, the whole system is set up to handle uh, cell kind of objects that may be fragile as well. And the sorting is kind of set up for that. So does this work with cardiomyocytes? So we tested it out. Much like the case with our conventional fax instrument, we found that we could, on the sorter, separate out what should ostensibly be our live cardiomyocyte population. But unlike the conventional fax case, when we sorted these cells, most of what we got back were actually our healthy rods. And this might be a little bit tricky to see even with these blow-up images, but what we saw was that the subcellular structure of the cells, in particular the organized sarcomeres, were largely maintained in our sorted myocytes. And when we quantified this, we found that when we took this enriched population, over 80% of the cells ended up being proper healthy rod-shaped myocytes, as opposed to the less than 5% that we saw with our conventional fax approach. And so this indicated to us that LP fax, this large particle fax approach, could isolate healthy rod-shaped cardiomyocytes. So as I mentioned, obviously our downstream application of interest was single cell RNA sequencing, but we were kind of curious since, you know, these rods look pretty good, could we do other assays on them? In particular, could we do functional assays? So we took some of these cells, we hooked them up to an ion optics rig, uh, where we're measuring, in this case, sarcomere contraction. And you can see here in this video, the cell actually still contracting post-sort and generating a sarcomere shortening curve. So we quantified this. Uh, and what we found was, so we did sarcomere shortening as well as calcium transients, kind of two of the standard uh, cardiomyocyte functional assays. And we found that for all intents and purposes, the sorted cells matched up pretty well with the pre-sort cells and were functionally competent. This suggested that we could use this method to isolate cells for functional analysis as well. So as I mentioned, the COPA sort that we use also has fluorescent sorting capacity. So we decided to test that a little bit. So we generated this mosaic system. We start with these, uh, these neonatal mice that have a floxed uh, TD tomato uh, as a fluorescent marker. And we inject them with a dose of this virus with a cardiomyocyte specific CRE. And so what happens is your cardiomyocytes uh, undergo the, you know, uh, LOX-P recombination and you end up with RFP expression or TD tomato expression. However, based on the dose of the virus, it's not every myocyte, it's a small fraction of them. So our question was, could we sort out these RFP positive myocytes from the negative myocytes? As you might imagine, the answer is yes. So first we gated to pick out our lives, cardiomyocytes, and then we found that we could easily separate out RP positive and negative and recover them independently uh, with more or less 100% fidelity. Okay, so cool, we've looked at functional studies, we've looked at fluorescence, but what about our initial question, which was for RNA sequencing? So the first thing we did was to look at the isolated RNA quality itself. And this is showing the results of a bioanalyzer curve. In particular, what we were quantifying was the kind of ratio of various ribosomal RNAs, which is often used as a quality readout of RNA. Uh, and this instrument spits out a quality uh, number that ranges from 0 to 10, where 10 is maximal quality. And all of our samples basically had maximal quality. The reason we had done this test is because we had seen other methods in the literature, and we had seen that their RNA quality numbers were actually much lower, sometimes teetering on the edge of whether you'd even want to sequence in the first place at all. Okay, so we did this, we did our sequencing. Our first question was, did we actually recover cardiomyocytes? And so we looked both at marker genes as well as scores from this classification algorithm called single cell net. And as expected, most of our, actually almost all of them, uh, showed clear cardiac muscle signatures. So basically taken as a whole, we started off with good input RNA, and we got back cells that had cardiomyocyte signatures. That's great, but what about the downstream quality of the RNA-seq data? How might we measure this? So 
there's there's a couple of metrics out there, but we chose to use the percentage of mitochondrial reads. Let me explain this metric a little bit. So if a cell gets lysed, uh, most of the cytoplasmic RNAs end up leaking out, and you might not detect them by single cell RNA sequencing. However, the mitochondrial RNAs are kind of in a separate membrane, and they'll often survive. So if you see a cell with a high percentage of reads going to the mitochondrial RNAs, you know that you probably have a lysed cell. And this is often used as a metric of, of RNA quality. Now, cardiomyocytes are very mitochondrially rich. But if you're seeing you know, really high percentages, you can still use this as a quality control metric. So what we did was we took a couple of data sets from the literature. In particular, we used bulk RNA-seq as our kind of positive gold standard control. And we compared to conventional facts, hand picking, which is as tedious as it sounds. You literally go in with the pipette and pick each cell one by one. And data generated by the Fluidime C1, which is kind of a chip-based capture approach for doing RNA sequencing. And so these have been published data sets, and we compared them against our libraries generated by LPFAX. And what we found was while our data matched up really well with the control, uh, these other data sets had much higher percentage of mitochondrial reads. In particular, conventional facts generated libraries with up to 93% mitochondrial reads. So now, in theory, you know, you can still kind of try and use this data, but first of all, you're wasting a lot of your reads to mitochondrial RNAs that you're probably not really going to analyze. Secondly, if you're trying to study a disease process, it's probably best to not start with damaged cells in the first place. So this gave us a thought that you know, LPFAS could uniquely generate high quality cardiomyocyte libraries for single cell RNA sequencing. Okay, so we got, we got it working cardiomyocytes. I wanna talk now about a particular application of this technology in our lab. As I mentioned, we're very interested in developmental processes. And one of those processes is cardiomyocyte maturation. So during the perinatal and postnatal window, Cardiomyocytes undergo a number of major adaptive changes in their structure, their function, their metabolism that enable them to do their adult function of contraction. However, our understanding of the biological process of maturation during this window is fairly limited. And we haven't really been able to use RNA sequencing to do this, or single cell sequencing, because of the technical limitations in isolating postnatal myocytes. So we decided to try and apply our LPFAX technology here. And our experimental design at first was fairly straightforward. We took mice ranging from P0 to P28, which kind of captures our window of interest, and we isolated the myocytes via LPFAX and then did single cell sequencing with our goal of trying to identify putative regulators of this postnatal maturation process. So we did our sequencing, and the first step we did was what we call trajectory reconstruction. For those of you who haven't seen this type of data, each of these points represents a single cell with its whole transcriptome kind of projected down to two dimensions. We then use this algorithm called monocle, which infers a trajectory along this developmental process. And the reason for doing this is while processes may kind of move unidirectionally, each individual cell kind of proceeds at its own heterogeneous rate. And so that's kind of captured if you quantify the pseudo time or distance along this trajectory. While you see a you know, jump overall from P0 to P28, individual cells kind of have their own rate of getting to this final mature state. So what we did was, we, now that we have this trajectory, we took all of the genes that changed across the course of this trajectory, and we input them into a computational software called Ingenuity Pathway Analysis. What IPA does is it says, okay, so these are the genes changing along your process. What are putative upstream regulators of those genes? And so we got back a list with many of them that were, they're kind of known to play a role in cardiac biology. We were particularly interested in two of them, PGC1 alpha and PGC1 beta, both because they kind of appeared fairly highly in, in this list but also because we had seen them in other contexts in cardiac biology and were really interested in them. PGC1 alpha and beta are known to be mitochondrial or regulars of mitochondrial biogenesis. Our question was, did they have kind of more broad roles in cardiomyocyte maturation? In particular, our question here was, 
how at the single cell level do PGC1 alpha and beta regulate postnatal cardiomyocyte maturation? So to test this, we went back to that earlier mosaic model I described, where you inject a cardiomyocyte-specific CRE uh, virus into this mouse with uh, flox PGC1 alpha and beta. Now I want to kind of illustrate why we do this system. So cardiomyocytes are clearly very well connected in the heart. And if a process knocks out a gene in all of them, you can have organ dysfunction, which in turn will kind of upregulate stress response in all of the cardiomyocytes. So the problem is a global knockout starts getting you confounded between the cell level effects of PGC1 alpha beta versus the organ level effects of dysfunction. We obviously want to isolate the first. So the idea is to titrate this virus such that only a small percentage of the cells actually have the knockout. This means that you don't have organ level dysfunction and you can study the effect of the knockout in this mosaic system by looking at cell autonomous effects. And this is kind of a really nifty system for biology. Of course, because we have this LPFAX technology, we can pick out these RFP positive cells from everything else. And so we did that and we projected those knockout cells onto this trajectory again. And what we found was at every single time point that we had assayed, the RFP positive cells showed a lower pseudo time score in indicating kind of a dysregulation as opposed to the control cells from the same heart. And so this suggested to us that PGC1 alpha beta knockout leads to some type of dysregulated maturation. And this is so, so this looking kind of at the molecular level. What about kind of more broadly at the cell function? So again, you know, the benefit of LPFAX is that we can do other assays. So we sorted our RFP positive and negative cells and just looked at their size and structure. And what we found were the RFP positive cells, these are our knockout cells, were generally much smaller and often showed sarcomeric dysregulation as opposed to the control cells. We also looked at uh, sarcomere shortening and calcium transients and found that these were also dysregulated in our knockouts. In particular, the knockouts contracted much more weakly than the controls. So this suggested that PGC1 alpha and beta has effects that go just beyond molecular effects, but they very directly affect the structure and function of cardiomyocytes. So I don't want to delve too deeply into this, and you know, I'd encourage you guys to check out the paper if you want some of the uh, details. But as a next step, what we did was we took the differentially expressed gene list from our single cell data and compared it against our PGC1 alpha and PPARA chip seq data. And after some downstream experiments, we found that PGC1 alpha can actually regulate a number of different aspects of cardiomyocyte biology outside of just mitochondrial biogenesis. Through this SF3B2, it can regulate calcium handling, and through the well-known YAP1, it can affect hypertrophy. So this suggested to us that PGC1 alpha has really broad regulatory roles in postnatal cardiomyocyte maturation. And again, just to get back to it, a lot of these studies were very uniquely enabled by our ability to sort out these adult cardiomyocytes for sequencing and other assays. So I'll briefly transition. Obviously, the, fo the large focus of our lab is on cardiac studies and postnatal cardiomyocyte biology. But we were curious to know if this would also work for skeletal muscle. Now, skeletal muscle is a little bit different than cardiac. With cardiomyocytes, you, you have these kind of a, kind of a brick-like arrangement of these cells in the heart. And they're all uniformly in that size range of about 125 microns in length. By contrast, skeletal muscle kind of has these myofibers that stretch oftentimes the entire length of the muscle, which means you can have some skeletal myofibers that range up to 30 centimeters in length, which are going to be difficult to study by really any method. However, the approach that a lot of people in the skeletal field use is to look at these small rodent foot muscles, in particular from the flexor digitorum brevis, which are about 400 to 600 microns in length, which is closer to uh, you know, our range of analyses. And so we tested this out. And we found that we could also isolate this, you know, healthy looking po population of skeletal myocytes. And we ended up seeing good intact myofibers. 
And you know, I'm not delving too much into this here, but we have a paper on this uh, where we sequenced a, a number of these skeletal myofibers to look for heterogeneity of uh, gene expression, suggesting again that we could use LPFACs to isolate these cells and do uh, single cell RNA sequencing. So before I conclude, you know, I've talked a little bit about our applications of this technology in cardiomyocyte and skeletal myocyte biology. However, as this field develops, uh, I think all of you are going to see that, you know, new technologies emerge. And in fact, you may have seen some of these other technologies in the literature already. So as I mentioned, I'm not affiliated with Union Biometrica, but I want to kind of emphasize what some of the advantages and disadvantages of these various technologies are. I'm generally of the belief that more technologies are always better, and different technologies will enable different approaches. In particular, two I want to compare against are the kind of emerged iCell A technology, which is a capture chip-based uh, approach for doing downstream sequencing, and this indrop technology, which is similar to 10x or DropSeq, if you guys have used those uh, seq tools. So all of them will have their place, but I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of the large particle facts approach. Firstly, you can use it to sort into PCR plates, which are, you know, the iCell 8 chips are often several thousand dollars as opposed to the pennies with the PCR plates. So this was nice and convenient for us. Secondly, while the iCell 8 can help you pick out fluorescent cells, it's not really good at enriching for them. By contrast, the COPAS lets you specifically gate and get only those cells. This is particularly helpful when you have a, only a small percentage of the myocytes are you know, RP positive, but you want to, those are the ones that are of particular biological interest to you. Lastly, these other two technologies were developed specifically with RNA sequencing in mind, and they're very difficult to try and use for other tools. By contrast, large particle facts is obviously fairly agnostic what you're, to what your downstream assay is. It wasn't necessarily designed for sequencing in mind, so it enables sequencing, but also, as I've described here, other functional assays. And that flexibility was really helpful to us. So again, I think all these tools have their place. These are some of the reasons why we really like this large particle facts approach. So with that, I'd like to conclude by you know, thanking all the people that were involved in this work. As I mentioned, we have a couple of papers and preprints on this. So if you're looking for all of the juicy, tasty details, please feel free to check those out. And if you have any questions on those details, please feel free to contact us. Uh, this work was done with help from a lot of different labs. In particular, I'm obligated to embarrass uh, three of my collaborators, uh, Sean, Brian, and Matt, who are really instrumental in making this work happen.